제임스 레니 아, 강좌 시리즈는 연세대학교 통일연구원이 메디치 미디아와 그리고 미국의 태평양 세계 연구소와 공동으로 해서 전 주한미 대사를 지낸 제임스 레니 박사를 기리기 위해서 만든 것입니다. 제임스 레니 박사는 아, 에머리 대학 총장도 지내셨고 그리고 1990 3년부터 97년까지 주한미 대사를 지내셨습니다. 한미 관계에도 큰 공헌을 하셨고 1994년 1차 북한 핵위기 때 대사로 계시면서 상당히 공헌을 많이 했습니다. 그래서 그분을 기리기 위해서 연세대학교와 태평양 세계연구소가 제임스 레니 석자 교수제를 만들었습니다. 제임스 레니 석자 교수제 프로그램의 일환으로 어, 미국과 세계라는 주제의 어, 제임스 레니 강좌를 준비하게 되었습니다. 상당히 새로운 획기적인 접근인데요. 이 강좌가 온라인과 오프라인으로 동시에 진행 예정인데 오늘날 미국 외교 정책의 주요 쟁점들 다 다룰 것입니다. 아마 이 강좌를 들으시게 되면 은 미국의 외교 정책 그리고 한반도와 관련된 것들에 대해서 가장 최근 업데이트되고 가장 그 이론과 실물을 겸한 아주 절충적인 이해를 할수 있다고 생각이 됩니다. 아마 한국에서 보기 드문 그런 강좌가 될 것입니다. 안녕하세요. Uh, for his role as a global affairs columnist at Wall Street Journal. Now, you may recall that China, at the, as the sing man of Asia, was so controversial. It has become one of the best columns uh, throughout the world. And in China, everybody knows you know, where to meet. <laughs> and, and, and also, he has uh, written uh, many, uh, several influential pieces in foreign affairs. And most importantly, he has published uh, Uh, many distinguished books. The most recent one is The Ark of a Covenant. It's about the relationship between Israel and the United States. He loves God. God and gold. It's about uh, Pax Britannica and Pax Americana. That was written more than 20 years ago. And also he has written a book called The Special Providence and how the American foreign policy changed the world. Therefore, a common theme throughout his books is a providence, covenant, okay, divinity. Okay? And I wonder, you know, today what kinds of lecture he will be giving to us, but apparently he will uh, send a message through that common theme. And as you know, that he's a uh, distinguished professor at Bard College, which was you know, supported by George Soros, and he's also a very good personal friend of George Soros. And also, he is a distinguished you know, senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. We all know that Hudson Institute uh, is the right of the Heritage Foundation, or? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> he doesn't think so. But anyhow, you know, he's so well respected throughout the United States. He's right. You know, I was always impressed by his writings and his speeches. Okay? His writings are so succinct, concise, straightforward. And a lot of American columnists, uh, you know, reluctant to, you know, borrow, borrow words and ideas from the European philosophers, but he's very free to, in, you know, quoting from them, like from Hegel, okay, Nietzsche, and whatever. And there's, in the sense, he's quite uh, unusual by American intellectual tradition, okay, and. And also, as you, I have given you the reading materials, okay? And I think that today he'll be talking about 
all these uh, Hamiltonian and Wilsonian, Jeffersonian, Jacksonian trends in the United States with regard to foreign policy. And I have a lot of expectation from him. Okay, with that introduction, and uh, Professor Mead will give about uh, 20 to 30 minutes in a lecture. Uh, and then that will be followed by about 20 to 30 minute conversation between him and me. And then we'll have another 30 minutes, which will be open to the floor. And uh, you can raise your hand and uh, ask questions to him. Okay, then we'll be uh, joining this session by six o'clock. Okay, with this brief introduction, let me introduce Professor Walter Mead. Let us give a big applause to him. Thank you. It, it's uh, a real honor to be asked to participate in a lecture series which is bringing some of the best known names in the world of American political science and international studies to, uh, to Korea. Uh, I don't really deserve to be in this group, I don't think. Um, uh, I'm kind of, I'll just admit it right up front, I'm a quack. I'm an imposter. Uh, I have uh, no graduate degree, whatever, only an undergraduate degree, and that's in English literature. So you are all absolutely within your rights to ignore everything I say. Uh, worse than that, I am not a specialist, but a generalist. Um, it's said that a specialist is someone who is profoundly mistaken about a few topics, while a generalist is superficially mistaken <laughs> about a great many. Uh, and so as a, um, as a generalist in the field of American foreign relations, uh, I try, don't specialize in Northeast Asia or Southeast Asia or Europe or Africa or Latin America. I try to think about how the different parts fit together into what might or might not be called a strategy. Um, and what are the patterns as we look over the 200 years of American independence? What patterns can we see? in the history of American foreign relations, and how could those patterns help us understand what is happening now, and of course, give us some insight into how American foreign policy might develop uh, given events that are going on in the world. Now, you asked me at the beginning to, to talk about um, uh, American conservatism, um, again, I'm not sure that I'm the most qualified person to do this. I don't call myself much of anything. Uh, I don't, you know, other people call me plenty of names. Uh, but um, when I think about my personal politics to the extent that, that I, I think this way, I think of the figure from British history, Edmund Burke, who is often considered a founding father of the conservative tradition in the Anglo-American world, but is also considered uh, in many ways one of the most profoundly liberal um, uh, thinkers of Anglo-American history. And Burke believed that for a country to advance, to move forward, to develop, it needed to do so in um, with a deep understanding of where it was coming from. That, but that he did not believe that you studied history in order to endlessly repeat the past or remain imprisoned by it. The, you would study history and try to appreciate and understand and value the, the traditions and the history of your culture in order to help, help reach a fuller potential, a richer life. And that in the long run, this was a, a, a better and stronger foundation for change than, um, than more radical approaches. I like Burke also because he was a, um, he was not always a predictable thinker. For example, he was uh, very much in favor of the American Revolution and criticized British efforts to suppress that revolution. 
He was also one of the most bitter critics of British colonialism and British imperialism in India. And he led, he attempted, he in, uh, led the indictment of Warren Hastings, a very rapacious governor general of, for the East India Company in, uh, in, in 18th century British India and was quite clear on the, on the idea that values like justice were not simply important in Britain, but also people in India and other parts of the world had equal claims under universal principles of justice to be um, uh, considered. And then he surprised many people by being against the French Revolution predicting that instead of leading to liberation in France, it would actually lead to dictatorship. He saw the reign of terror coming, and he predicted the rise of someone like Napoleon, who then plunged France and Europe into a generation of war. So do we call this man a liberal or a conservative? I'm not sure, but I consider him to be someone well worth studying and someone whose example I think we can all learn from however, wherever we may find ourselves on the political spectrum at any particular time in our lives. But enough about me. Uh, let's talk about my country. Let's talk about um, conservatism in the, uh, in the United States today. Um, generally speaking, the conservatism of Edmund Burke is not a leading political force in the United States today. It rarely has been. Um, that when we think of conservatism in America today, I think we, we tend to think of roughly three different groups uh, we might call one MAGA world, Make America Great Again world, the Donald Trump movement. Not everyone, not all people in that zone are necessarily supporters of former President Trump, but it's clearly a movement. Then we can also think of the neoconservatives, the people who in the Bush administration, particularly George W. Bush administration, saw American foreign policy as attempting to transform the world through um, democracy promotion by force if necessary. Now they're a very complex group of thinkers, but they are, they have almost nothing to do with, with MAGA world. The, the gap between these two strains of thought is, uh, is immense. And most of the neoconservatives would now fall into the never Trump camp. Many like Bill Kristol and I think Max Boot have left the Republican Party and become Democrats in part because of their revulsion against uh, uh, former President Trump. And then I think you also have a, a group of libertarians, uh, you know, people who believe in small government, in um, uh, uh, low regulation and so on, who would look to someone like Margaret Thatcher, perhaps the British prime minister, as an example. There are other groups we can speak of social conservatives, evangelical Christians, many of whom are not very enthusiastic about former President Trump. So we can divide this movement into many different groups. And within them, there are other groups. It's perhaps not well known, but there is a very significant group of, of black American conservative writers and thinkers. There's Justice Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court, but there are people like Thomas Sowell, uh, John McWhorter. There is a real group of, of uh, and, and a somewhat distinctive approach to American politics and American life that we see from this group. So conservatism in America, like liberalism, is a, is a collection of movements rather than a single movement. It's not particularly well organized. It doesn't, American political parties tend to be quite weak. This is partly, I think largely for structural reasons. 
that in many countries, I don't, I don't actually know the situation in Korea, this is my ignorance speaking, but in many countries, the sort of leaders of a party select the candidates for different, for seats in the National Assembly. Um, and so the leaders of the party have tremendous power in the party because if the, if the leaders in the party don't approve of what you're doing, you don't get a seat or in a proportional representation system, you get listed number 500 so that you only get a seat if your party carries every vote in the election. And so in that case, this makes party leaders and party organization extremely important. In the United States, in the American system, essentially every member of Congress and every senator is their own individual entrepreneur. That is, they don't, it doesn't, if I'm a congressman, I don't really care very much if the Speaker of the House likes me or doesn't like me. What I care about is, will the people in my district vote for me in the next election? And especially, can I either avoid a primary in my own party for the election or win a primary? And in primary elections, uh, usually you have a very low turnout, sometimes 20% or even less. I believe when AOC won the Democratic primary in New York, against, uh, uh, I think it was Mr. Crowley, a very uh, senior congressman, less than 20% of the population <laughs> voted in, of the eligible voters voted in that primary. So you can win something like that with 10%. So this gives incentives to people in Congress to focus on just that small group of very loyal, very active followers. And that's one reason I think where, why our politics actually tends to be a bit more polarized than the nation. And that politicians on both sides of the aisle often seem to be appealing to extremes rather than toward the center. So the parties are weak. And when we add to that, that there are many different currents of thought in the liberal side of the, of the system or the conservative side, then I think you can see that, that instead of being a well-organized place, the American Congress is kind of disorderly. And it's impossible to tell at any given moment, as we see now in Republican politics in the House of Representatives, they can't seem to decide on a speaker, or at least they haven't yet. Um, and we find revolts. We find party leaders unable to um, uh, get a majority of their own side, much less of the entire system. So. That means that with that, that these different factions in the Republican Party, if we want to turn out of the more conservative side, can flourish. That is, in districts where MAGA Republicanism is very strong, you can have someone who is entirely focused on that section of the electorate getting elected and, and the leadership has no power over that person. But in the same way, in a state, say, like Utah, which has not been very favorable to MAGA uh, Republicanism, but which is a very Republican state, Senator uh, Mitt Romney is representing Utah now, uh, you can, a very, very different kind of Republican can win election, again, regardless of what the party leadership says or doesn't say. And so we're going to have this diversity, I think, for some time. Um, and I actually suppose I should say one little thing about um, the fundraising. In American politics, we have, we have a bunch of strange election campaign finance laws. I think it's actually almost every country has very strange campaign finance laws because you have to have money to succeed in politics, and yet nobody really likes thinking about how money gets into politics or whose money gets into politics. And so, it's, so the legal situation is often very strange and tortured. 
in the United States, it's a mix of laws that have been passed and then which laws Cong- uh, the Supreme Court has struck down and which laws or parts of laws it has allowed to go forward. So no one ever actually planned our campaign finance system. It's a mix of laws by Congress and then how the courts have kind of chopped them up and resorted them. And one of the impl- one of the places we are is that there are rather strict limits on how much money people can give to political parties. But it is much easier to support an individual politician. And again, if we go back 50 or 100 years in American politics, if you lived in Connecticut and you wanted to influence political leadership, you would um, you would give a large you would give a lot of money to the Democratic Committee of Connecticut and the leadership, which meant these professional politicians sitting in their smoked fill rooms with cigars had enough money to make or break candidates for different offices. Um, and being professional politicians, they were usually less interested in ideology than in finding a candidate who could just win. Because that's what really interested them was power, not ideology. And so um, uh, you had stronger parties. But today, uh, as if you're a billionaire, you can give only a very little bit of money to a political party. And there, you can give more to an individual candidate. But what you can really do in an unlimited way is give money for what's called independent expenditures, where you buy ads for one candidate or against another candidate. So our system uh, has ended up, without anybody intending it, making individual donors extremely powerful and making political structures and political organizations quite weak. And if you add that to the primary system, Uh, you can see why perhaps American politics shows so little sign of real organization. There are advantages and disadvantages to any system. I'm not going to try to comment on, on this. Some of you may have questions. So what this means is that in the Republican Party at this moment, we see all of these different tendencies of thought, each being supported Uh, but no mechanism in the Republican Party to sort of bring them all into a consensus. So there is no Republican Party line. There is no conservative line on anything. And for that matter, no Democratic Party line either. If we want to talk about foreign policy, and I suspect since uh, most people here are not Americans, American foreign policy is is American domestic politics is mostly interesting to you because of its possible impact on American foreign policy. Let's move to how some of these different factions think about foreign policy. And here I am going to go back and talk about the book that I wrote uh, almost a quarter of a century ago called uh, Special Providence, American Foreign Policy and How It Changed the World. And this this book started for me from the perception that there were two things about American foreign policy that everybody seems to believe. One is that Americans are really terrible at foreign policy, that it's we have a chaotic political system. At times we make ridiculously idealistic statements At times, we seem to be trying to conquer the whole world. And at other times, we seem to be trying to walk away from the whole world. Um, We see at at times we might send the CIA in to save United Fruit in Guatemala. But at other times, we seem to be um, getting into a terrible relationship with a country like Burma over human rights for reasons that seem obscure. So it's just a mess. It's one thing after the other. And and so people have, have said from the beginning of American history that the American Republic is bad at foreign policy. 
On the other hand, if we look back at the history of the last 200 years, one of the clearest trends in international politics has been the gradual rise of the United States to power and influence in the international system. So that in 1790, the United States was a very weak and marginal power. And obviously after 1945, it really became the dominant power in the world. And so the question would be, why does a country which is so bad at foreign policy, whose politics always look like they're a hopeless mess, what has enabled this ridiculous mix of idiots and incompetence to become as powerful as they've been? Otto von Bismarck, the German chancellor, thinking about this um, in the 19th century, uh, just threw up his hands in frustration and said, God must have a special providence for drunks, fools, and the United States of America. <laughs> and so my book, Special Providence, is trying to understand what was that special providence that Bismarck was talking about. And I won't go into the whole thing because we don't have time. But one of the things that I found in this book, as a right researching this book, was that you can find four different ways of thinking about America and American interests have been present in American politics from the 18th century right up until today. And uh, you can look back at our arguments over foreign policy, at the, at the different approaches our presidents have taken, and you can see these different ideas at work. Some are stronger at some times in our history, some are stronger in others, but they're always there. And I think they're quite relevant to our politics today and even to conservative politics today and to MAGA politics today. The most, uh, probably the, the, the form of American foreign policy that is the most uh, uh, well noted in a way is what I have called Hamiltonian foreign policy after Alexander Hamilton, who was George Washington's secretary of the treasury and really played a, a very large role in developing our, our national government through the Constitution and through his work in the Washington administration. And Alexander Hamilton said, well, we're a new republic. What should our foreign policy be like? And he said, well, what's the most successful country in the world? And in 1790 to him, the answer was pretty clear. It was Great Britain. So to, to be powerful and to be free, America needed to imitate, look at and learn from Britain. And what was, what was the key to British policy? It's this, the British government through the Bank of England was actively promoting the development of a strong national economy, strong technology, it built a navy to support its trade and the wealth that the Bank of England and the commercial system plus the international trade created made Britain the world's most powerful country. And so the Hamiltonian idea is that great corporations with a pro-business but strong federal government should form the foundation of, an, of, of a healthy, strong American economy and political system. And the United States should then trade globally and promote the trade and have a navy to protect its trade on the high seas. And Alexander Hamilton and George Washington thought in the late 18th century that if the United States did this, we would ultimately replace Great Britain as the leading power in the world. It happened, whether because of their ideas or not, it's who can say, we can argue it, but it did happen. Uh, there's another strain of American foreign policy that um, also is familiar, and this is, uh, I named this for Woodrow Wilson, the president who led us through World War I, founded the League of Nations, even though he couldn't bring the US into it, and Wilson, while he had some very realistic ideas, and he also had some bad ideas, frankly, mostly about race, um, Wilson believed deeply that 
the cause of war, of international conflict, was bad governance in countries. And so countries that, were, that had dictatorships or that were ruled by absolute monarchs or theocratic despots, these countries had poor economic uh, performance. Their peoples were unhappy and restless, and their leaders looked for glory and adventure in foreign enterprises, you know, imperialism, wars of conquest, to build up their power at home. And so the way to make America and the world safe from this was to promote democracy, that democratic countries wouldn't go to war with each other, um, and so, by, so that America, by following its high ideals, could actually make itself safer. And so that was the way, that vision of American foreign policy, obviously we still see it today. But those, those are, and, and by the way, both of those forms of foreign policy looked, and looked toward a creation of some kind of world order. A Hamiltonian world order based on trade and commerce and a Wilsonian world order based on human rights. And I think it's fair to say that from the end of the Cold War until quite recently, American foreign policy was basically dominated by Hamiltonians and Wilsonians. Sometimes they agreed with each other, sometimes they disagreed with each other, but we, we were looking at world order either in, a, in commercial free trade terms or in human rights democracy promotion terms, and very often in a kind of a synthesis of both. Uh, so free trade with China would make China democratic and that would make everyone safe. That kind of thinking. And it's been very powerful in the United States and still, still has its supporters. But there are two other ways of thinking about America and foreign policy. One is I named for Thomas Jefferson, who was... Um, uh, the third president of the United States. Over his career, Thomas Jefferson held almost every possible opinion. So to call something Jeffersonian is not to say that he agreed with it all in his career, but, but there's a big idea that he had. He looked at what, what uh, Alexander Hamilton was doing and he said, are you insane? We, the English government is a dictatorship. It was so terrible that we had to fight a long and bloody revolution to get out from under it. And so now your goal is to recreate Britain in America, to import a, a mechanism, because you know what, if you have, if you're trading around the world, you have powerful government, all right, you're, the rich are gonna prosper. And it will be the interests of the rich. The rich are the ones who own the corporations, not the poor. And so you're going to be helping rich Americans get richer. You're going to draft poor Americans to fight the wars to make money for rich Americans. How is that liberty? How do we say that this is the American Revolution was to create a class system in America like they have in England? No. The way to defend liberty in the United States, which is what's really important, is to have as little foreign policy as possible. No wars, unless we absolutely have to, unless they attack us. And even then, let's try to negotiate before we fight, because war is so expensive and so terrible. No, let's, democracy promotion crusades, oh come on. We should try to keep democracy here at home. It's not our business to be, you know, again, sending American boys overseas to fight wars so that children in other countries can live in a democracy. Don't be ridiculous. Let's just try to perfect our democracy at home and let us inspire people by our example to build a better democracy. That's the Jeffersonian vision. And you can see it today. I think to some degree, Bernie Sanders has this view, but so also do people like Josh Hawley, the Missouri Senator, and Rand Paul. And this is actually the kind of, when we speak about isolationism, Jeffersonianism is probably the closest 
of, of my schools of thought that correspond to the category of isolationism. And the final school, and this is the school I think that, that many people associate with Donald Trump. And I can say, by the way, that Steve Bannon uh, read my work on Andrew Jackson and decided that this is the school that Trump was a Jacksonian. So we actually took Donald Trump down to the graveside of Andrew Jackson. And Trump then hung a portrait of Andrew Jackson in the Oval Office. So they were they were nailing the flag to the mast here. Uh, and uh, I think Steve Bannon was, was surprised to discover I'm not really a Jacksonian, as I told him. Um, you know, as a scholar, you can study a lot of things without necessarily uh, uh, sharing them. But in any case, the Jacksonians are a populist group. They are not in, they don't trust cor big corporations. They don't trust big government. They don't even trust army officers. They tend to think the, the enlisted soldiers are good and the volunteers are good, but they wonder about all the fancy officers in the Pentagon with all the gold braid. Uh, you'll hear people today talking about woke generals, and this is kind of an echo of this populist suspicion of the officer class combined with deep, deep support for the militia, in a sense. The Jacksonians are very suspicious of government. They think all politicians are corrupt. All politicians are corrupt. Um, and so if you tell them that a politician that they support is corrupt, um, they say, yes, and. Uh, so they would say, yeah, and the reason that they might say the reason Donald Trump is being indicted is not because he's the only corrupt politician in America, but because the elites don't like him, and so they've singled him out for prosecution. So it's a populist suspicion of government and of the permanent civil service. They call it the deep state. You've probably heard this phrase. And Jacksonians, like Jeffersonians, are not interested in human rights crusades overseas. They are not interested in building a world order based on free trade. Their idea is live and let live as long as other countries don't attack the United States. But if another country attacks the United States, then we go after them. So we saw after 9-1-1, Jacksonian America rose up against Afghanistan uh, and followed George Bush into Iraq. After Pearl Harbor, again, Jacksonian America was so willing to fight Japan thousands of miles away. Um, and if you look at the during that war, one night in Tokyo, American bombers um, dropping incendiary bombs intended to create fires in civilian neighborhoods actually killed something like more than 80,000 Japanese, mo almost all civilians in one night of bombing. That's not even Nagasaki or Hiroshima. But Jacksonians, when their country is attacked, like bees from the hive, they come out and they want to sting the attacker to death. Um, and so if we, so that that's the kind of nationalism in a way that Donald Trump is evoking. Although, in fact, his policies tend to be sometimes Jeffersonian and sometimes Jacksonian, and we can talk about that in conversation. But I've probably talked long enough here, and I think it might be useful for us to have a bit of a conversation and then maybe to have some of our audience participate. Thank you very much. Let us give, a big, let us give him a big applause now. Thank you. It's really fascinating the way you categorize four trends of American foreign policy by recalling to the leading American politicians and thinkers. But here, when I examine all those four schools, okay, Hamiltonian school, Wilsonian school, Jeffersonian school, and Jacksonian school, how can you categorize Richard Nixon and Harry Kissinger? Mm. I don't see their element. What 
so-called the mainstream conservative who say that, uh, ah. that their view of realist, realist view of the world is a real conservative in American well, foreign policy. I oh, think yeah, that's a good question. And I've actually uh, talked to, to Dr. Kissinger about this some. Uh, one of the things he has said is that when he was in government, he actually did not understand American politics very well. Um, but again, Dr. Kissinger is very unusual. He's over a hundred years old and he's now involved in the study of artificial intelligence. He's still writing new books and studying new things. And this, by the way, for all of us, whatever we might think of some of the things that Dr. Kissinger was involved in politically, for all of us, if you want to know how to stay healthy and happy well into old age, curiosity, engagement and interest. Keep your mind awake. Uh, anyway, um, I think that, Dr. that Kissinger and Nixon embraced intellectually something that I call continental realism which is a sort of, you know, um, Hamiltonianism is an American realism. That is, Hamiltonians believe in a balance of power, believe that while a world order is possible, it's not certain or necessary, and that one must always keep an eye on the strength of the nation and the, you know, improving the position of the nation. But they do think it's possible that through a global commercial system, you actually, greed could triumph over hate. And you could, in fact, in theory, have a peaceful world order. Continental realists, darker realists, some might say structural realists or others, would tend to say, no, conflict between nations is eternal, dictated by the nature of states and so on. And this was, this is certainly the language that both Kissinger and Nixon would have used at various points. Neil Ferguson's biography of Kissinger is making an argument that there's something idealistic in, in Kissinger's conceptions. And I, and I actually think Neil has a, has a point there, uh, that, that there is something, Kissinger's search quest for balance, like Metternich's, who he does very much think of as a kind of a predecessor, is a hope for as much peace as it's possible for us to have in this dark and difficult world. And so it's not a con it's not consciousness, if you see what I mean. But it doesn't have this sunny character of, well, we can make things decisively better. I think both Nixon and Kissinger could have done better in American politics if they had cast their um, administration more in the Jeffersonian tradition. We are liquidating the commitment to, to the South Vietnam. We're trying to get out of the war because of what it's doing to American society. And we are trying to create detente with the Soviet Union and work with China to balance the Soviet Union again so that we can have a less activist foreign policy, save money, reduce our commitments. And I think had they used that vocabulary more they might have made a, a better argument. But in any case, they did what they did. Yeah, but, you know, from international relations theory perspectives, when we talk about American conservative camp, we usually think about Harry Kissinger or Richard Nixon or some other so-called mainstream realist in the United States as a conservative, you know, uh, foreign policy school. And then we have a neocon that which would combine power with value, right. okay? And then the third I mean, school is a MAGA school is a, is a retractionist, you know, the posture. Therefore, you know, it's the way you classified four schools and the way the traditional IL theorists you know, classified three schools, the, I see there's some missing point. The, the missing point is called the major Skullcroft, let's say, in right. Kissinger. See, well, I, again, I would say uh, Skullcroft and Kissinger, I think, were a bit different in that I would call Skullcroft a Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian. Because, you know, Skullcroft and George H.W. Bush were classic Hamiltonians. Free trade, 
global order based on a strong American state, which was grounded in a close and cooperative relationship with big business. That's, that's a, I, to me, that is a much better description of Bush and Scowcroft. Uh, when I think of Nixon and Kissinger, neither one of them was particularly interested in economics. Uh, seriously, Kissinger, you know, Nixon once said to, to Kissinger, Henry, you don't know anything about economics. Go talk to John Connolly and he'll teach you something about oil markets. Uh, and so um, the, the essence to me of Amer the distinction between American realism and what I call the continental realism, the European mainland realism, which some might call classical conservatism, is the commercial focus, the linkage of power with trade and commerce in a way that Metternich did not or that uh, even Bismarck did not. Okay, <clears throat> let us go back to your book on the Ark of Covenant. And you emphasize the really biblical solidarity between the United States and Israel. And that is why the United States should make every effort to defend Israel. Now, the tragic event is unfolding in Gaza and Israel. And it is really sad, you know, development. Now, how to solve the problem? I heard that uh, uh, President Joe Biden will be visiting Israel yep. in the coming days. And how to you know, get out of the problem? We, have, we see the real dilemma there. Right? Yeah. Well, I was actually very careful in uh, Ark of a Covenant not to make policy proposals because I wanted this to be a book that people could read who were pro-Israel and people who were anti-Israel. And I was, you know, I was actually very much helped that uh, some of my friends who are in some cases Palestinian and and uh, other Middle Eastern Islamic uh, scholars and writers reviewed the manuscript and helped me with suggestions and even blurbed the manuscript. At the same time, some very uh, conservative and well-known Israeli Zionists and American conservative Jewish Zionists in, uh, supported it. So I tried to write a different kind of book. Um, when I do think, when, when asked why does, um, why does is, is Israel this important to America? And I think that's the, um, whether people are for it or against it, they care a lot about it. And that's generally true globally, not just in America. Maybe a little less in Japan and China, but actually in India, Israel is a big issue where the BJP is very pro-Israel and the Congress party has been much more critical of Israel. In, uh, in, in, if you go to Northern Ireland and you go to the Irish Republican, the Catholic Republican neighborhoods, you'll often see a Palestinian flag flying in those neighborhoods. But if you go to the Protestant Unionist neighborhoods, you can see the Star of David. If you go to downtown Seoul, you can see the American flag, Stars and Stripes, Star of David, and the Republic of Korean flag, yeah, Taguchi. Yeah. So it, it, but know. they do not know why they are carrying stuff, David. <laughs> but they're still carrying. And I explain after having read your book, I can explain right. those in you know, ultra conservatives. That it tends to be, uh, but there's a the core. I think, but we could go into a long, long discussion of this. But if we think about the years 1944 to 1948. I think of those years as very much the birth of our modern world, end of World War II, beginning of the Cold War, uh, establishment of what became the international order that we are sort of thinking about today. Um, and 1944, this is the year when Soviet troops first begin to break into the, con liberate the, concentra the extermination camps in Poland where there had been talk of the of the Holocaust, the murders of the Jews. But we begin to see this horror unveiled. And of course, at around the same time, the evidence of what the Japanese were doing in China and Korea also begins to come up. And, you know, 
the world for the, since in the century since the enlightenment century and a half had there'd been a lot of optimism yes human history is dark yes terrible things were done in the past but now but the problem was that human beings were ignorant and poor now thanks to science and technology and modern techniques we are developing economically we have the money now to educate the young we're getting better we are we are overcoming the darkness that used to be in the human heart well it's a lot harder to say that after what we learned about what happened in World War II, where we see human beings with all the powers of science and technology, Germany and Japan, two highly developed societies, carrying out the most vicious atrocities that, you know, Genghis Khan and the Mongols could not have done worse. Right. So it suddenly begins to look as if maybe the enlightenment is not true, that the darkness in the human heart is deeper than anything that modernity can cure and that we are still the same dangerous creatures. That what, what should we do with Israel? Well, and well, here's the thing. And then, OK, next, 1945. The atom bomb. And so this dark, evil creature now has the power to destroy all life on Earth. And I think all of us in this room, everyone on the Earth is living in the shadow of those events. To this day, we have not escaped them. Uh, and then for Americans who have this tradition of the Bible predicting a return of the Jews to the Holy Land, the Jews, miraculously, the Jews appear in the Holy Land, establish their state. So for Americans, this was the, and for actually many Christians around the world, this was a sign that even in these dark and terrible times, the God of the Bible is real. The God of the Bible acts in history. There is hope. That Israel became, the, the state of Israel became a symbol of hope for millions of people who were in great internal fear and panic. So now this so that this to this day we see in American politics and in the politics of some other countries a sense that that an attack on Israel is somehow an attack on our hope. Right. Um, OK. So, so President Biden knows that politically it's important for him to be engaged here. Um, I think what, what the Biden administration had been doing before the Hamas attacks was that it was trying to orchestrate a regional bloc, bring Saudi Arabia and Israel and then the other Gulf states, most of them along, into a kind of an alliance the United States would uh, essentially give them the same kind of security guarantee we've given the NATO countries, Article 5, which then would mean that these countries could live with a nuclear Iran. And the United States wouldn't have to fight a war with Iran to stop the nuclear bomb or else watch Israel start the war, which the, would almost certainly drag the United States in. So it looked like a plan for peace that would stabilize the region, but marginalize Iran, block Iran's ability to dominate the region. Iran did not want this to happen. And I think it I think Hamas and Hamas did not want it to happen. And so this attack by Hamas in, uh, from Gaza is an attempt to, to break up that nascent relationship of United States, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Israel uh, that would marginalize Iran and the, quote, axis of resistance and force the U.S. now to try to be the, the umpire. Israel, you can attack Gaza this much, but not that much. And with the Arabs blaming America and Israel if it did too much, and with Biden having a political price, if it does too little, they wanted to. They, they, it's an effort to put the United States back in that position to break up this emerging order for the region. 
And my own sense is that what the administration hasn't done that it needs to do is just recognize that that while we are not at war with Iran, Iran is at war with us. That Iran literally seeks the destruction of Israel, and it literally seeks the destruction of American power. That it is not, they aren't looking for a compromise. They're not saying, okay, well, if you respect our interests, we'll respect your interests. They actually are looking to win a confrontation. This doesn't mean that we need to invade them. It doesn't mean that we need to bomb them necessarily. But it means that we need to understand that in the Middle East, we are working that there is an enemy working against us, that Iran is linked with Russia closer and closer. China is, has, we see, is leaning toward Hamas in this crisis. We don't have to ask where North Korea stands in this crisis. Uh, and so what we see is that this regional crisis, which is serious enough on its own, is being sort of, is, is becoming part of a global uh, standoff or a global competition. Yeah, I really hope that the creation of Israeli state would lead to the new millennium, not to the millennium of destruction, chaos. This is, well, I, you know, I, I myself, um, every time I, I, you know, I, as a Christian, I do, um, you know, uh, try to think, as I read my Bible, I'm thinking about world events and trying to understand them. But the, what I understand is every time I, I see Jesus talking about the end times, what he says is it's going to come by surprise. Nobody, you're not going to recognize it when it's happening. And I look at how when Jesus came, he was not what people expected. He came in a different way. So millennium, good millennium, bad millennium, no millennium. I don't think I'm going to know and I don't think I'm meant to know. But I think we do have values, we do have hopes, and we have responsibilities. Yeah, in 2021, you wrote a very, very controversial column in Wall Street Journal. Ah. Okay, China is the thing man of Asia. Do you still, of course, that was during the COVID-19, and also China was having problem in dealing with COVID-19, but now the COVID-19 COVID issue is now gone, but do you still believe China is a single man of Asia? Well, let, I would suggest, uh, if anyone is curious about this, go back and read the article. The headline, China's the sick man of Asia, I did not write that headline. <laughs> I had nothing to do with it. If, if anyone here who is a columnist would know, at least in American newspapers, the writer doesn't write the headline. The editor writes the, the headline. So, and if you actually look at the article, what it says is that the COVID epidemic that has come out of China is not the only danger that's coming. I said Chinese financial markets have the potential also and pointed to some other problems. Yeah. And I would say that, that that has been pretty fully confirmed by what has happened that that in fact, the, you know, the rise of China. I am not someone who hates China by any means. I've been to China many times. I have friends there. My books have been translated into Chinese. I've lectured in Chinese universities. And I do believe that the path forward for humanity is not war with China, but finding a way for um, for for a rising China to live in peace with neighbors who are not endangered or intimidated by its rise or its power. That's not easy. Okay, now, then if, now, if you look at the several indicators of China, China is definitely declining, okay? Chinese rise may not pose a real challenge to the United States. Now, can the U.S. live happily with China, declining China? Well, Again, I think that depends more on China than on the U.S. in the sense that in the U.S. it's pretty clear we want nothing more to do than stay home and watch TV. Uh, we're not, as a people, uh, particularly you think after the Iraq war, after the Afghanistan war, if you listen to the American people, you don't hear a lot of people saying, oh, what can we invade today? Where can we go start some trouble? 
you hear people saying, I want to spend money at home. I don't even want to have free trade with other countries anymore because it's too much trouble. So I don't think our mood is an expansionist one right now. Uh, but I do think the the fear that that uh, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea might sort of continue to act more closely to disrupt the international system and and endanger ultimately the U.S. No, really, do you think whole this idea of China threat mm. is it contrived or real? Real. And real? I'll give you an example. It is, a, it is a Washington elite perspective I'll, I'll or give, ordinary American no. citizens view. Uh, in, in the polling, it's American citizens. But I'll give you an example. I think that I that I think really matters to Korea, which is that. If China were to decide to attempt the forcible unification with Taiwan, not even with an invasion of Taiwan, but with a naval blockade, what would happen in Korea if that happened? Well, the answer is there would be no shipping coming in or out of Korea because you couldn't take shipping through what would be a war zone. And so there would be no imports of oil into Korea, no imports of food, no raw materials. There would be no ability of companies to export their products. So you would have an immense, even if there is no war on the Korean peninsula, you would have the greatest crisis in Korea since the, the Korean War. Um, now, the, you know, will that happen? We can't say, but but honestly, people on both sides in the Chinese space and in the U.S. space think that over the next five to eight years, there really is a, a significant danger that this would happen. Uh, so this is the, you know, and then from, again, when I talk to people in Japan about this crisis, they're actually quite focused on it. And the, you'll hear people in Japan say things like, if China forcibly unifies with Taiwan, Japan would have no choice but to basically make its peace with China because China would control the trade routes by the sea lanes that Japan gets oil from the Middle East and Japan's trade. Korea, by the way, even more so. So that if the island of Taiwan can remain in the status quo, I don't call for independence of Taiwan, but simply peaceful continuation of the status quo, it means that Japan and Korea can go on with their own development in their own way. Uh, but if something happened to change that, you see fundamental life, massive changes here, and changes that would be quite dangerous to the United States if Japan and Korea were sort of forced into a Chinese sphere of influence. So this is, this is really an issue that, that does engage people in the U.S. And I, I think it actually, you know, when I've talked to, even in India, when you talk to people in India about the, the economic consequences of a conflict in the Taiwan Straits for India, a thousand miles away, you people are you know in India. People are thinking, okay, we need to we need to see that our interests are are safeguarded here in some way. So there is a danger. It does not. I do not believe that China is sort of rising and rising and rising and rising, and you know all of us have to forever keep bonding together. I look at the history of Asia and I see that the terrible crises and wars of the last 150, even including imperialism, 200 years have been the product of uneven development. That is, Britain industrializes ahead of the rest of Europe and of Asia and it builds the empire in India and it begins coming into the Far East to try to do the same thing here. Japan, seeing this, develops very quickly with the Meiji Restoration and gets way ahead. And, and Japan in that moment is tempted into this dream of conquering and ruling Asia in these terrible fantasies of domination, which then, you know, it goes and, and tries to accomplish. Um, the Soviet Union emerges from World War II with this kind of power. And today, China uh, has achieved on a massive scale, a level 
of modernization that gives it temporarily, I believe, encourages some people in China, not all, but some, to have fantasies of what China could accomplish. Okay, now, again, when the Biden administration just studied, you made a very interesting proposal, okay, which, which attracted a lot of attention from liberals in South Korea. You proposed a detente with North Korea. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very sensible approach. Well, it, it was not welcome in Washington. <laughs> but can you elaborate on that? Well, that I look, the detente with North Korea? I, unfortunately, I think maybe the time for that has passed because at the time, North Korea was pretty isolated and depended mostly on China. North Korea does not want to depend on anyone. It really wants, you know, Juche, independence. Um, and the Kim dynasty wants control, and it does not want to be accountable to anybody about its control. Um, and so one can see if North Korea is totally dependent on China, that's something that people in North Korea might want to change. And so possibly the U.S. could reach out. And there was, I think, some real interest in the Biden administration, as there had been in the Trump administration, in at least exploring these possibilities. Unfortunately, I think today, Russia has basically has, has taken the place that North Korea has, is no longer only dependent on China. North Korea has another partner. And Russia is, is no longer in the United Nations. Sanctions don't matter anymore. None of this matters. And so I'm afraid that, that North Korea in alliance with Putin now has a different path. No, I think that that's a very important point, you know, because North Korea has been trying to normalize relationship with the United States for the past 30 years. You know, North Korea was having one side love on the U.S., but U.S. has been kicking away. Why okay. is the problem? That's, what was the problem? All right. You know, it's again, that's not that is not the impression that I've had of it. I've been to North Korea. I actually am one of the people who went to North Korea before I went to South Korea. And that was an experience. Um, uh, one thing I did find the, the, the people are actually kind of similar. Um, and the North Koreans actually warmed to me when they discovered that I like kimchi. Uh, so we had a, some, some interesting personal moments there. But um, I think that North Korea, uh, part of the problem has been the nuclear issue, where we have had from many South Korean governments uh, and from Japan a strong sense that they wanted the United States uh, to, to stop North Korea's nuclearization. This is something North, that's a price North Korea has never been willing to pay. But for the United States to break its alliances both with South Korea and North Korea, I mean, and Japan over the North, over accepting North Korea as a nuclear weapons state, particularly again with North Korea's very bad record of proliferation, has never really been an appealing prospect in the U.S. Um, and again, the Wilsonians don't want to do it because of human rights. Um, uh, but it is, the, the, there's also, I think there's always been a bit of a question on the U.S. side of sincerity in terms of, you know, what are we dealing with with North Korea? Um, I think now, I don't see a prospect. Um, I talked, I've talked to people in three different American administrations, all of whom actually were interested in it. Um, all of them came to feel that the reason that there was no progress was not actually in opposition in Washington to what they were trying to do, but just the limits of what they could accomplish with the North. Uh, it is, it's a very difficult problem. For now, then you live with a nuclear North Korea? There's no other choice. Now. That, I, you know, it's a, it's, it's a nuclear state. Uh, and, you know, this is, uh, uh, I, I, personally, I don't, I think we, I don't think anybody right now has a North Korea policy. 
in the sense that um, uh, we're not willing to say the, the whole denuclearization discussion is over. Um, I don't know that the other countries in the region, including South Korea and Japan, are really eager to say it is. I, China is certainly not happy with the idea of North Korea permanently establishing this. So it, you know, North Korea remains a, 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 one of those problems that keeps getting worse, that no one seems to have good answers for. Uh, I'm, if anybody has the answer, uh, I'm willing to put my email out to receive it. But uh, okay, now, my final, you know, question: How about Ukraine? Mm -hmm. okay, now it's, it's very interesting to see the debate between John Mearsheim on the one hand and you know, partly you know, Stephen Walt and and John Eikenberry on the other hand. Okay, whole issue of what eastward of NATO was a real cause of Ukraine and, right. you know, problem. Do you agree with it? Yes and no. I, in, in the 90s, I was actually quite cautious about uh, the expansion of NATO. Uh, it seemed to me that the, what I actually wanted to see was uh, to establish, including Finland, Sweden, and Austria, with the recently independent states, uh, into a kind of a mid middle alliance that would be guaranteed both by Russia and by NATO, so that these countries would actually have a NATO guarantee against Russia, mm -hmm. uh, but Russia would not have NATO coming right there. Um, I, that was probably impractical, but at least from the standpoint of navigating this divide, I think it made sense. Um, and I said that if we are going to expand NATO, what we really needed to do back in the 90s was expand NATO right up to Russia's frontier, because at that point, Russia was not able to do anything about it. And you might as you know, just pull the bandage off all at once. Don't like take a little bit. And then the worst thing of all would be to leave uh, uh, some countries in between Russia and NATO, because if you say, if you put up don't, no fishing signs on one side of the lake, but you don't put up signs on the other side of the lake, you're sort of saying fishing allowed on the other side of the lake. So I think our policies ended up creating a zone of instability. I don't, however, blame the people who had those policies. People always have imperfect policies. There's no force of nature that said to Putin, your life is not complete unless you invade Ukraine. Now, Donald Trump once said that if he get elected, you know, I can solve the Ukrainian problem in a week. Mm. Well, first, do you think that Trump will get reelected? Second, do you think he can really fix the Ukrainian problem in one week? And third, is the whole this MAGA faction within the Republican Party has been strongly opposing any further aid to Ukraine. What is your take on that in a posture? Okay, well, step one, I don't know if Trump will be reelected. I think it's too close to call now. We have 13 months still until the election, and or 12 and a half months, I guess. We're halfway through October now. But, um, uh, and there's so many events. Think of the things, think in the last year and a half, we've had a war start in Ukraine. We've had war in, in Gaza. What's coming? Um, the possibilities for a financial crisis with interest rates going up. We cannot predict. The polls show the two candidates, Trump and Biden, are pretty close. So it could go either way. But also in 13 months, neither of them is particularly young. And uh, <laughs> anything can happen. One can have a stroke. Um, uh, by the way, in terms of old politicians, I'm sure people here remember uh, Silvio Berlusconi, the prime minister of Italy. And if you remember, he used to get in these terrible scandals with models on his yacht. Okay. Remember that he was 80 years old, all right? Okay, 
And for an Italian politician, it's much better to have everyone talking about all the teenage models you're chasing across your yacht than, oh, he's too old to be prime minister. People weren't saying that about Berlusconi. So different politicians handle their age differently. But, you know, so so can Trump win? Yes. Will he win? I don't know. Can it, will he solve Ukraine in a week if he's elected? I doubt it. Um, he he was, if, as I recall, he was going to build a wall in Mexico uh, on the border and make Mexico pay for it. Not much of a wall and Mexico didn't pay. So, you know, po- he, like every politician, he runs for office. He makes promises. He makes dramatic promises. We'll see. Um, then on the question of support for Ukraine, I think the real problem in my mind right now is that I don't think the United States has a clear policy for Ukraine. That is, I think, as I understand what I hear from the Biden administration, the idea is let's keep giving Ukraine aid until the Ukrainians realize they aren't going to win the war and agree to negotiate, right? Um, Now this, you know, you can see why someone might think that was a good policy. It allows you to look in the mirror and say, I defend liberty. I'm not making Ukraine do anything and I'm not appeasing Putin. Uh, In reality, it's your, you know, when you say to the American people, I want us to pay a hundred billion dollars while Ukraine loses the war. Many people would say, why not just cut out the hundred billion dollars? You know, why drag it out? So the policy, as I've described it, which is, of course, not how the administration would describe it, but it's what it sounds like to me. That policy cannot hold public support forever. And so they're going to have to either find a better approach to the to the conflict if they really want to to build support for the long term or um, or I think we will watch um, policy decline. I saw somebody said if the if if our policy is an endless war with a side order of nation building, we are not going to be able to sell that policy to the American people for very long. But having said all that, I would like to see Ukraine win. I think I think if you I I would like I can't tell you where the boundaries should end, but I want this war to end in a way that the Ukrainian people have the right to decide their own future. And I want people around the world to say Putin attacked a peaceful neighbor without any provocation and he suffered a stinging setback of some kind as a result. Because if Putin does not learn that lesson, Xi Jinping will not learn that lesson. Kim Jong-un will not learn that lesson. And we will all live in a more dangerous world. Okay, now I will open to the floor. Okay, Uh, Ambassador Cho, uh, would you you give a, a microphone to him? Uh, Ambassador Cho Hyun is a graduate of uh, our Department of you know, uh, Political Science and Diplomacy. Uh, he's a uh, graduating class of 1976, and he was our first and second vice foreign minister, and he was our ambassador to Austria and the United Nations. His last uh, post was an uh, ambassador to the United Nations. And yeah, welcome back to an alma mater. Thank you, Professor Moon, and uh, thank uh, Professor Lee for your uh, talks today. Uh, years ago, when I was still in the government, one of my Chinese colleagues said to me that uh, it's quite unfair to call China a segment of Asia. Why? Because they select and elect their leaders. It was, of course, before the emergence of Xi Jinping um, and before the evolution of collective leadership and atomistic designation of the next leader. Well, 
I would have been persuaded, looking at what has been happening in the United States recently, but I know better, uh, under the uh, Xi Jinping system, nothing can be compared with it. Nevertheless, I think uh, the US uh, can do better now. So I would like to ask your uh, prescription for a better governance system in the United States, for uh, more efficient, uh, fairer, and yet free governance system. Mm -hmm. That leads me to my second question. Uh, what is your assessment of uh, your industrial policy uh, under the Biden administration? Uh, you talk about foreign policy for the middle class. Mm -hmm. But the US government has been very critical of uh, Korea's industrial policy for decades. And also, you, you've been criticizing the industrial policy of China. Uh, it sounds a bit like a double standard, if not hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. Uh, finally, uh, you have made a good comparison between enlightenment and darkness of human nature. Uh, I often thought that maybe enlightenment is too much for human beings. Nevertheless, in the same context, what's your assessment of Rhino Lieber? Uh, moral man in moral society. Because Somehow, to me, American foreign policy represents the realism based on uh, right on neighbor. Mm. Thank you. There's some big questions. <laughs> big questions. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if I can give uh, good answers. Um, on how um, uh, the American system could be improved, I think we... Um, we really are standing on, on an age of, at the beginning of an era of enormous change. That the, you know, the sort of social model that developed, we could maybe call it the social market capitalism or um, the sort of Western European American model that emerges after World War II, mass middle class sustained by mass blue collar, factory work, um, regulated economy, and so on. This has been breaking down for a number of years. I think it's breaking down because the information revolution is changing the way the economy works. And we've gone from, after, after World War II, uh, human societies had sort of mastered the techniques and the problems of the Industrial Revolution, more or less. After a hundred years of social upheaval, economic upheaval, political upheaval of every kind, we had sort of figured out not how to eliminate the business cycle, but to tame it, to provide a, a good standard of living for workers without throttling enterprise. All of these things, we had this system and we thought it would not change. And when the Soviet Union fell, we thought that this system had now demonstrated its, its uh, superiority over the communist system, and therefore it would now be certainly last forever. But the information revolution is destroying it from within. It's dying of success, not dying of failure. And in the US, the number of um, the rate of disappearing jobs in manufacturing and clerical labor, all right, is as fast as farmers leaving the land during the Industrial Revolution to move to the city. And so you cannot have an economic change like that without social upheaval. We, and, and if you, I look at American history, between, say, the assassination of Lincoln in 1865 and the assassination of McKinley in 1901. And during those years, it's very hard to think of a single good law passed by Congress uh, 
a single good policy. We had social unrest, populism, the failure of reconstruction, enormous corruption in the government, huge gaps between rich and poor, more social conflict perhaps than at any time before or since in our history. But at the end of it, we had developed an industrial economy and over the next generation, we learned how to use the wealth that an industrial economy generated to address the problems that an industrial economy caused. I think some way, in some way we are going through an era of that kind now. And it's very hard, just as no one in 1870 could have told you what our policies would be in 1950, I think we also have a very difficult time diagnosing, much less treating, the problems. So I think we are doomed to have a time of unrest and experimentation. And here I do think the openness of the American system and the ability of people to try different things may mean that we, that we come through it to the other side faster than some. Or maybe not. It's the future. I can't tell you. Um, very briefly on your uh, uh, Niebuhr, Niebuhr question. Yeah. yeah. Industrial policy. Oh, industrial policy. Look, I think. Combined. Right. Combined. All right. Look, I, I, industrial policy. I think. Um, I don't think. First of all, I don't think Jake is a hypocrite. Jake Sullivan, who who wrote the article on foreign policy of the middle class, I th I don't think he would criticize Korean industrial policy in the past. I think he says we should learn from it. So he's not a hypocrite. And a country can have one policy at one time by one group of people and another at another time by others without being hypocrisy or double standards. It's just... Political competition brings different people with different ideas to power. And I think that's what we have. But I don't think it's going to work. That's another question. On Niebuhr, I absolutely agree with you that the sort of Christian realism of, of Niebuhr is an important touch point for understanding American policy and American society. I think we need, I, I think what Niebuhr's, to me, his greatest achievement was taking the, the religious doctrine of original sin and making it an intellectual um, artifact, in a way, a tool that people could use who didn't necessarily share his religious convictions so that the sort of wisdom, and, and I think the concept of original sin is one of the most profound philosophical statements that humanity has ever found. Um, make, unlocking the treasure of that idea to make it available for the analysis of politics in a multi-religious and even non-religious society was great. I, would, I hope we can have more Niebuhrs who can do that with more ideas. Okay, student, identify yourself, okay? Make a short question, okay? Um, good evening, Professor Lewin and Ali. Um, thank you so much for the lecture. It was a very um, helpful. Well, would you identify yourself? Oh, sorry, so much. <laughs> um, my name is Han Kim, and I am an undergraduate. I'm in my junior year at the University of International Studies. Um, I have one um, um, last question. Is that I also been, um, I am very concerned about um, Iran, North Korea, and Russia and China now um, aligning the powers war and trying to disrupt the global order. So after if um, the four countries try to dismantle the power of the United States, then would they able to come up with an agreed or united uh, rule of order? If not, um, would this um, next rule order that they have in mind is unprecedented or unpredicted to the state? Good question. I don't think they have any common idea about what they want. They have a negative idea that, that they don't like the current world order, but they have completely different ideas of how it should be changed or even whether there should be an order. I'm not sure that, that President Putin believes in any kind of order, but simply competition of the strong against the weak and we do what we can. 
Um, I think China has a vision of a Sinocentric world order rooted in its own history. Um, I think North Korea just wants to be left alone. Um, and I think, uh, and I think Iran has a, has a, its own version, if we were Christian, we'd say a crusading, but a, you know, of, of a wanting to transform the world and create power. So what holds them together now is a common view that this American-led or rules-based order is a danger to them and an obstacle to their ambitions. Uh, myself, I think as long as Putin, in a way, Putin's alignment with China is a compliment to the United States because the minute Putin thinks China is stronger than the United States, he's likely to flip <laughs> toward the United States against China. So we can, we can see here his, you know, his vision of the world. If the United States, if a meteor were to land on the United States tomorrow and we simply sank beneath the ocean, I think what you would see would be a, a, a pretty much a struggle for power, much like we've seen in the history of the world. Uh, perhaps some kind of order would ultimately emerge, but it would be on the far side. There would be an ocean of blood as well as the ocean that had over, overcome the United States. Okay, next. Um, first of all, thank you for the very insightful lecture. Um, my name is Chusan Mang, and I'm currently a student at the NC University's Humanities Art and Social Sciences Division. And I think I'd like to ask you a question about Korea. So, uh, as we see uh, combined military exercises, rock US military exercises, constantly fluctuate in scope, and we also have a recurring topic of increased bilateral cooperation. So in light of what you've seen with um, U.S. responses to recent regional conflicts that uh, you have around the world since uh, the last two years, uh, what does this cooperation mean um, and in your eyes? And uh, how much of a stake do you think the United States has had here in Korea? Do you think it has changed since the end of the Korean War in 1953? And would you, how would you uh, now expect the United States to react should there be a conflict, um, a conflict on the Korean Peninsula? Good questions. I think, first of all, I say things have changed dramatically on this peninsula, and America's stake in Korea has changed dramatically since 1953. Um, because in 1953, Korea was one of the poorest countries on earth. Um, today, Korea is one of the most successful countries, not merely on earth today, but in the history of the world. And Korea's success in, in building economic development, building social development of the Korean people through education, uh, building a democracy, um, exporting a culture of values, and becoming a leader in soft power as well as one of the top 10 economic powers in the world. Uh, Korea today is an asset in a way that the Korea of 1953 in no one's dreams, perhaps, uh, could have become. And so the United States today, for perfectly selfish reasons, would be foolish not to value this country as a friend and an ally. Um, and I think uh, as we all think about, again, I don't want to say, I do not believe in some kind of contest to the death with China or anything like that. But as I know Koreans have been concerned about some of the pressure that China has placed on Korea and other Chinese neighbors have worried. So as we, we worry about trying to keep China within the bounds of, of behavior that work for its neighbors, let's say, Korea plays an indispensable role. Finding a way to deepen relations between Korea and some of the other neighbors in the, in the area, I think is, is important. I hope you succeed in this, but it, uh, Korea matters. That's at least my belief. And I will go back to the United States, uh, more convinced than ever and trying to share this with, with others that I meet. I'll pick up the last, you know, comment or question from the floor. Okay. Uh, this side, okay, let us give that side, okay? <laughs> and uh, Che Bo-hyun. Uh, I'm Huyun Che from East Asia Foundation and also the junior student in Kansas University. Yes. So I, my question is that, as you mentioned, the Ukrainian, the 
the U.S. government do not have really an uh, exact approach on the Ukrainian war. So is there any um, policy suggestions for the United States government on the Ukrainian war? It could be either financial aid or humanitarian aid or even uh, military support. I think we probably need to uh, increase our military support. Uh, that um, uh, I think what's happened is if, if we look at the history of the war, uh, different groups have suggested providing different arms to the Ukrainians. And the um, uh, and there's always been a, a concern that Russia would then respond with uh, some kind of nuclear escalation even or something else. Um, and then after a few months of discussion and debate, very slowly, the new weapons arrive. This strikes me as the worst of all courses because you end up providing the arms that you worried would give the escalation, but doing it in, on a way that doesn't lead to a positive military result. I think we should, we should think clearly about where the objectives are. I think we would have a, we would be in a much better place if Putin was, we need for Putin to feel that this war is a problem for him and that he needs to bring it to an end. Now, I actually think a lot of this wouldn't happen on Ukraine, in, in actually in Ukraine. For example, we've seen in the last nine months, the Wagner mercenary group has basically conquered and created a new Russian empire in parts of Africa. And it doesn't do this to bring civilization or security or trade. It's looting. It's it's piracy of minerals. It's all kinds of things of this kind. Um, I don't think that Vladimir Putin should be able to to build an empire in Africa with his left hand while fighting a war in Ukraine with his right. And so there are ways of going after Russian activities, not necessarily on the battlefront of Ukraine, but in ways that change Putin's thinking about what is the wisest course for the future of his country and for his own rule. So I think we need to be more creative here. Uh, is what is, is what I really think. And again, allowing this to turn into a contest of what weapons is the West willing to give Ukraine and how much money is it willing to give Ukraine and for how long is to sort of agree to fight by Putin's rules on on the ground of Putin's choosing. In competition, you don't want to play against your opponent's strongest suit necessarily. You want to look for ways around and surprises. Putin has, Putin is a much weaker, Russia is a much weaker country than any of the leading European countries in terms of economy and other things. But for 15 years, because Putin is more willing to take risks and, and do the unexpected, he has been able to humiliate and push back countries that are actually by any measure far stronger than he is. So I think we need to, to sort of wake up and get out of the box and stop thinking so bureaucratically and mechanistically. This, again, does not mean some kind of massive escalation on the front lines. It means thinking about what are the sources of Russian power, perhaps in Syria, uh, economically, what are ways to cut the various links that hold his regime in power or hold up his economy? We're not doing a very good job of this, and I think we can do better. We have a, one, one last ah, you know, okay. question. Okay. Hi, uh, hello, I'm Tyler Wynn. Um, I'm Reggie from the U.S. Uh, I'm going to Yonsei uh, uh, Graduate School of International Studies. Uh, my master's is concentrating in international security and foreign policy. Um, so as someone who was originally pretty Jeffersonian and Jacksonian uh, in kind of foreign policy views, as I used to be in the U.S. military, um, I kind of see um, your, like, basically what I'm trying to ask is, 
looking at foreign policy after World War II, um, which kind of moved away from isolationism to be a lot more involved worldwide, um, we see that, um, if you would argue per se, um, would you say that one, America is kind of moving towards being more involved globally just because they kind of saw what isolation does, which is eventually drawing them into these kind of worldwide conflicts? And two, if you agree with that, um, I know you said you're not sure if Trump or Biden is going to win the next election, but presuming that Trump does, um, what are your kind of recommendations or adjustments you think that um, kind of politicians should make uh, which better aligns kind of Jacksonian slash isolationist uh, foreign policies to be more friendly or see foreign policy goals as more appealing? Okay, uh, very quickly, I think um, uh, we should remember that the, the leaders who, who laid the foundations of the current world system back in the 1940s and early 50s were trying to solve a specific set of problems. Soviet expansionism in Europe, reconstruction of Europe, decolonization at a time of ideological competition, things of that kind. And they, and the design that they produced and the policies they produced were calculated to address these very pressing problems. They did a pretty good job, not by no means a perfect job, but today the problems that the, if, if, to, if this were year zero today, and you were to design a world system from scratch, you wouldn't do it. For example, you wouldn't have a United Nations Security Council with Britain, France, you know, with, with three European countries, Britain, France, and Russia, and a, a real paucity of Asian countries, et cetera. You would do things differently. And part of the problem is that, that some of the institutions that we created back in those days are quite difficult to reform. But also that the world with things, you know, the Internet, this is nothing that we had back then. And thinking globally or something like climate change, we have a whole different range of problems. And there's often a serious mismatch between the institutions that exist or the practices of the institutions that exist and the actual issues that need to be addressed. So I think we do need fresh thinking. Uh, and we need, we need to, we, we cannot think that what we're trying to do is we are the loyal grandsons trying to carry on the great work of our ancestors and perpetuate the traditions. We have to be Burkean about it. That is, we have to look, we have to look for the living sources of vitality in these traditions to innovate from the basis of what's been accomplished. All right. Then on MAGA, uh, getting the isolation more involved. I think what I just said might help with that, that, that part of the problem is that people look at the world order and they don't necessarily see that it is working very well or that it is all, all that admirable. So let's make it better. Walter, thank you very much for your magnificent in a lecture. Let us give a big applause to uh, Professor Mee. Uh, now, we'll be having two lectures in November. One is offline lecture by Dr. Siegfried Hecker and Robert Carlin, and they will be giving a talk on avoiding uh, nuclear catastrophe on the Korean Peninsula. And they will be giving lecture at Kim Dae-jung Presidential Library. And another lecture will be online by John Eikenberry, He's staying in Oxford now. We'll be having uh, online, you know, webinar with uh, John Eikenberry on American liberal foreign policy as opposed to conservative foreign policy. Anyhow, uh, let us give a big uh, in applause to Professor Mead and thank you very much for attending today's lecture. Thank you. Outstanding. Thank you. Superb. <clears throat> Forces of conventional forces. Fighting and incidentally they're gonna wipe out the last of the markets, the last of the on the nuclear security. In, in exchange for weapons development. You know, we've got a new continent.